Back in 2007, I was visiting my father in his double-wide trailer in Vail, North Carolina. The land and the trailer were completely paid off, so my father lived completely debt-free. I was 12 at the time, and normally spent my time wandering around outside on the spacious 20-acre property across the fields and through the trees. On this particular day, I wish I would have taken the time to invite a friend. Having another witness there might have been helpful. I remember that day was bright and warm, barely a cloud in the sky. I was goofing off out back behind the trailer in my own imaginary world, swinging a stick sword around like I was a knight or pirate or something, and making a load of noise. My dad's pit bull china was leashed to a runner line that allowed her to run all over the backyard, but on that day she was lying down underneath the back porch in the shade. I remember I was darting from tree to tree and knocking my stick against the tree bark when I was distracted by my neighbor's dog suddenly going apeshit. I wandered back towards my dad's trailer and peered across the dirt road up the winding driveway to see the German Shepherd leaping around and barking from behind its fence. I had heard that dog bark plenty of times before, but there was something different about this time. The dog wasn't just barking as if announcing its presence to scare off a squirrel or something. It was practically roaring a deranged challenge and trying to leap over the chain link fence to get at something. I glanced back at China, but even though she had stood up and wandered out from behind the porch, she wasn't barking. She just stared out across the tree line to my left. I turned around and looked through the trees, expecting to see a coyote or a bear. In retrospect, I was much more curious than alarmed, but after another moment, I shot right past alarmed, directly to terrified. I noticed the shadow before I saw it, because the shadows cast by all the trees were swaying in the wind, but there was something that held steady. The thing in the trees was built like a linebacker, incredibly broad, and standing out what I would guess to be about six or seven feet tall. It had silky, jet black fur, and was hunched forward slightly, as though it was preparing to leap forward and attack. I don't know what possessed me to do it, but I took a step forward to get a better look. That's when I noticed its hand. It flexed its strong, clawed fingers and raised its hand to rest up against the tree it was standing by. It then gave a low, deep growl. <laughs> and I finally made eye contact with it. For a split second, I thought it was a person with a dog over his shoulder. And then it occurred to me, that was its face. That long snout, twin rows of pointed teeth, and fiery yellow eyes were its own features, and it was standing less than a dozen yards away from me. I sprinted around to the backyard, towards the back door, turned the knob, and slammed my shoulder into the door, but it didn't budge. The door was locked. Fearing that I was about to get eaten alive, I dove under the porch with my dog China and crawled as far back as I could. China crawled back with me and lay down beside me, still looking in the direction of the creature. Every so often, she let out a deep, intimidating growl. I'm not sure how long I hid down there under the porch, but once dusk began to settle, I slowly crawled out back into the open. I sprinted around to the front of the house, went in, and locked the door behind me. Almost immediately, I began to have a panic attack. I had left China, and she was still attached to her runner line. I should have gone out the back door, grabbed her line and pulled her inside, but I was absolutely terrified at the idea of exposing myself to that thing out there again. I banged on my dad's bedroom door and asked him to bring China inside because I had seen something out there. But he was already half asleep and called back to me through the door that she would be fine. I spent the rest of that night cowering in my room and praying that the morning would come soon so I could check on my dog. All through the night, I didn't hear any barking. I didn't know whether to take that as a good sign or not. My dad knocking on my door woke me up with a start. He took me outside and pointed out across his property to the far end of the trees and showed me that something had broken into the chicken coop and tore apart every single hen he owned. Two of his goats that had been tied up nearby were found torn apart. I checked under the porch and saw that China was fine. She was sitting there quietly. Even though my dad was confident that his dog couldn't have been the one that caused all this damage, he checked her teeth 
and discovered that there was no trace of blood or feathers. Later, he went to check the neighbor's German Shepherd, but there was nothing found in that dog's teeth either. I tried to explain to my dad that I had seen a creature in the trees the day before, but he didn't give my account a second thought. I would later tell my cousins, my mother, and several of my friends. Not one of them believed me. The older I get, the more convinced I am that I saw something that I wasn't supposed to see. Instead of fading, if anything, the memory seems to become even more clear. I've sat down to sketch the memory several times, and each time it looks like the same creature. Looking back, I should have returned to the spot I had been standing at to see if there was any tracks. My dad would eventually conclude that it was a pack of coyotes. China lived out the rest of her life as an indoor dog. After that night, I begged my dad to let her stay inside with me. I couldn't help thinking that she was the one who ultimately saved me. It's okay to be skeptical, but don't ever ignore your gut feeling. And when it comes down to a possible life or death scenario, it wouldn't hurt to keep an open mind. So a few years ago, when that video of the giant spider-like monster climbing up the building in Russia hit the web, most people watched it with curious fascination. I remember the feeling of pure dread overwhelming me. Not because of the video itself, which was eventually revealed to be a fake, but because of a memory it pulled from the depths of my subconscious, where it had lain harmless and dormant. After watching the video, I covered all the windows in my home, shut off all the lights, and quivered in terror for a full day and a half, too nervous to even go out and get the mail. It wasn't because I felt I was being stalked or hunted, but because I was so terrified and my head was spinning, and I couldn't process anything bigger than just lying still and trying to calm myself down and control my breathing. I don't remember when exactly the memory I'm recalling took place. It was sometime in the early 90s, and I was maybe at most 6 or 7 years old. My parents went camping deep inside a national forest. At the time, my parents were writing a book about birds, and I'd come out to the forest to birdwatch and take notes. I'd gone to bed early the previous night, most likely tired from all the hiking. I had woken up at the very crack of dawn. I crawled out of my very small, kid-sized tent. And for whatever reason, I wandered over to a fold-out chair overlooking a valley that my parents were observing. In addition to the two pairs of binoculars they carried, there was an older pair that they had brought along for me, and that pair was sitting in its case by the chair. I'm not sure why I didn't just go directly to my parents' tent and try to wake them up, but instead I decided to sit out there in the open and look through the spare set of binoculars. They were bulky and heavy, but I raised them to my eyes and began looking for birds. Being an impatient kid, I didn't look through the trees long before my eyes fell upon a bright blue object in the distance. I focused my attention on that and discovered it was another tent. I could even see the zipper flap where the opening was. Looking back as an adult, I have no idea how far it was. No closer than 100 yards, definitely. But beyond that, I couldn't realistically guess. I looked at the tent for a while, but when nothing happened, my eyes began wandering again. That's when I noticed it. I didn't hear anything first. There wasn't a stomping in the trees of approaching footsteps, or the sound of snapping branches. There was nothing but silence. Something crossed between two trees past my field of view. It was huge. So large, in fact, that for a split second I thought it was an elephant. But then I caught a better look. The creature had four extremely long, spindly, crooked legs, which, looking back now, based on its size compared to the trees around it, it had to be at least seven or eight feet tall. The four legs met in a bloated dark mass at their peak. Its body was comically small given how long the legs were, and it had two antlers sticking out at one end of the body, which I assumed was the front. I say antlers, but they were more like crooked horns. That's about as much detail as I can clearly remember. I remember standing up off the chair and lowering the binoculars. I saw the creature silently move towards the blue tent. With absolutely no hesitation, it skewered the tent between its two front legs, tore it open, and pulled out a figure. I was so shocked at what I was seeing, I didn't even think to raise the binoculars again. I seemed to remember the figure had dark skin, 
and maybe a gray shirt, gray or dark green. It wasn't until I saw a splash of red splatter on the blue tent that I dropped the binoculars and took two steps back, now full on terrified. I don't recall screaming whatsoever. In fact, I don't even remember the sound of the tent ripping. I just remember the creature raising one of its front legs and impaling the figure neatly on one of its horns before turning and retreating back into the trees. That's when I turned around and ran back to the tent. I tripped on the way back and smashed my face into the dirt, resulting in a scrape on my chin. I climbed back into my tent and hid in the blankets. I eventually had to urinate, but I was so scared that I stayed put and wet myself. Hours later, or at least enough time for the sun to rise considerably higher in the sky, I heard my parents get up. They moved around the campsite for a bit, and I remember wanting to tell them to hide. My mother eventually opened up my tent and peeked her head inside, and the first thing she did was ask if I had wet my sleeping bag. I guess she could smell it. When she saw my face, I guess I looked terrified enough to her because she asked if I had been sleepwalking or had a nightmare. She noticed the scrape on my chin and gently helped me out of the tent. I was visibly shaking and looking around in all directions for the unknown creature, expecting at any moment that it would appear and attack us. My father asked me why I hadn't put the spare binoculars back in the case, but when he saw my face, he immediately came over and asked me what was wrong. All I could say was that I had a nightmare, and I wanted to believe that I had, but the scrape on my chin and the bright blue tint in the distance, which was now torn and being tossed around in the breeze, confirmed to me that it had been no dream. My parents decided to cut the trip short, and we packed up and went home. The strange thing is, I don't really remember what happened when we got home, or what I told them, but I still vividly remember that blue tent out on the horizon, abandoned by the creature, and never to hold its former occupant again. I had buried that memory so deep, that I took an internet prank with a similar looking creature to drag it back up into the forefront of my consciousness. I'm going to try hypnotherapy to revisit that morning in my mind. I would ask my parents if they remember that trip, but my mother has since passed away, and my father is suffering from Alzheimer's, and can't remember my name most of the time. I never found any missing person reports regarding that forest during that time period either. I don't know what I saw. I need to understand what happened. I don't want to be afraid anymore. I write this not for the sake of entertaining you with a suspenseful story, but to inform you. There are dangerous creatures out there that will grab you when you aren't expecting it. Too many people have gone missing in national forests for me to chalk this up to bad luck or coincidence. I've spent some time each day writing about the creature, trying to jog even more memories so I can better face my fear and uncertainty. I've taken to calling this creature, the unknown. I had a friend who once lived on 40 acres of heavy forest in Marshland. Once the warmer weather began, we would put together a group of six people and go paintballing, playing on teams of three. In my mind, there is absolutely no better place to paintball because the terrain varied from rocky to wetlands from steep to smooth, depending on the area we chose to use. It was entirely private property, so there was no chance of running into anyone else or being reported for trespassing. And since the area was so expansive, we would often find ourselves playing somewhere new on the property that we had never been to before. We would normally use quads or dirt bikes to travel to different sections of the property, and on the afternoon that this happened, we drove until the tanks were half empty and then traversed another quarter mile on foot before we drew lots for teams and scattered into the woods. The theme of that battle was Marvel vs. DC, so each of us had assigned ourselves a code name of a comic book villain from whatever side we were on. I found a small bluff to use as an overwatch point and picked out a spot to hide for a few minutes while I adjusted my helmet and boots. Once I stopped shifting my weight around, I knelt down for a few moments and then I heard the sound of uncontrolled sobbing coming from nearby behind me to the south. For a moment, I considered that it could be one of my friends, but after I removed my helmet, I listened more closely. I realized the voice was much too deep. It sounded like a fully grown adult crying like a drunk at a funeral. I debated whether to ignore it, 
but my curiosity got the better of me. Setting aside the fact that this was private property, and no one but us should have been this deep into the woods, the man sounded like he might have needed some help. About halfway to the source of the noise, I encountered one of my teammates, who had also heard the sobbing and decided to investigate. The two of us moved forward together with our paintball guns up, knowing full well that if we were walking into actual danger, they wouldn't be very useful at all. After another moment, we discovered a crumbling two-story brick house that looked to us as though it had been standing there since the Civil War. The sobbing and wailing was coming from one of the upstairs windows, though by this time it had died down considerably. The friend who lived on the property wasn't there with us, otherwise we would have just had him deal with it. What we should have done was go back for help, but again we were curious and concerned that this sobbing man may have been in some kind of trouble. We carefully entered through the busted front door, not making a sound to announce ourselves. All the windows were missing, so the inside had a damp outdoors feel to it. There was dirt, leaves, and rusty beer cans all over the floor, and despite it being so drafty, the place reeked of pot and sweat, and someone had spray-painted the words, stay here on one of the inner walls. Once we got to the base of the stairs, I decided the tension had gone on long enough, and I called out, Hey, are you alright up there? It was like I had awoken a grizzly bear. Someone upstairs roared with insane fury, and came charging towards the top of the stairs with purpose. Dust fell from the ceiling, as the stranger upstairs came sprinting forward to attack. We turned and launched ourselves back out the front door and back out into the trees as the screams of a haggard man warned us to back off. We took position in the trees in case the guy decided to follow us. That way we could open fire at him with paintballs and at least slow him down. But once he got to the front door he paused, squinting stupidly at the daylight for a moment before heading back inside. We each only caught a glimpse of him. Imagine the sweatiest, scraggliest beard, attached to an old scarecrow with about 14 layers of solid coats on. We marked our position as best we could, and headed back. When we finally got back to our friends, they reported that they had run into two very drunk and furious homeless looking guys, who had charged at them for a few yards before they were forced to defend themselves by firing off several paintball rounds and driving their attackers away. We booked it back to the bikes, drove back to our friend's house, and called the police. A patrol car showed up there in about 20 minutes, but no one headed out into the woods for close to an hour, until there were enough men gathered to head out and investigate, and have air support from a helicopter. It wasn't until after dark that we discovered at least four homeless men had been living in that old brick house, and one of them had died in the night, likely from an overdose of some kind. Two of them had wandered off to go look for a car to carry him away and bury him. The third had stayed with him and sobbed uncontrollably over the death of his friend. Apparently the place was well known in the homeless community, as somewhere that you could go to to disappear for a while. Even though there were several knives found in the house, none of the men had any weapons on their person when they were found and arrested for trespassing. My friend's parents have since scheduled the small house to be demolished, and were completely unaware it had been there to begin with. That's my story. Perhaps not the scariest encounter ever, but it definitely put life into perspective for us. We were just dumb kids out having fun without a care in the world, and unknowingly stumbled across a safe haven for men whose lives were hopeless and fueled by drugs. Had we had not been so careful, some of us or all of us may have never made it back to the house alive and who knows how long it would have taken before our bodies were discovered.